Okay, so today we are going to talk about American industrialization. Um, last week we did a little bit of um, work looking into the kind of some definitions of what industrialization is. Now we're going to look at how it actually impacted um, the United States and business here in the U.S. and kind of what it what it did. So. First of all, um, the impact of industrialization, uh, we see one of the first things that we see is the growth of national markets. OK, and so the growth of national markets just means that markets across the nation where there, there are markets across the nation where the same goods are available. So you can get the same T-shirt in New York and in California and everywhere in between. So a national market means that the same thing, the same goods are available across the country. All right. Now, there's a couple of reasons why this is able to happen. First and foremost is because of the railroad. So we talked last week about the railroad being a factor for industrialization, but it's also one of the reasons why we see this growth of national markets. This idea that if you live in Washington, D.C., you can get the same thing in New Orleans and you can get the same thing in San Francisco because the railroads were built. So um, I love these maps here. They show you just the growth of railroad in just in 20 years between 1870 and 1890. Um, we see such a huge increase in the amount of railroad that actually existed. So the railroad provided transportation across the nation. Um, as I mentioned last week, the Transcontinental Railroad was completed in 1869. Um, one of the key reasons for that was because of the Civil War, we saw a lot of uh, railroad growth happening in the 1860s um, in order to transport goods and troops during the war. But even after the war, once we saw kind of how um, powerful the railroad can be in terms of moving products, it really continued um, throughout the rest of the 19th century or the 1800s. Another reason why we saw national markets happen during this time was because of the development of chain stores. Today, we think of chain stores, things like Walmart or Target or Costco, right, where the same stores are in all sorts of places across the country. They're selling the same products in their stores all across the country. Um, as you can imagine, this has a really significant impact on local business because it's really hard to compete with these chain stores. Today, you may hear the phrase big box store, but it's the same thing, right? These chain stores have lower prices um, because they have more stores across the country. They, they're able to have more capital or more money, and so they can have lower prices. Plus, during industrialization, toward the end of the 19th century, we see chain stores offering credit. So you could buy something now and then pay later. So this was something, one of the reasons why we see chain stores happening um, across the country. And this, again, connects back to the growth of national markets because now you have the same store in many places across the country and they're selling the same goods or the same products. Another impact of industrialization is the growth of big business. So I'm going to have to cover up part of the title here. Um, so we see the growth of big business happen during this time. Um, in particular, we see corporations beginning. Um, so if you, one of the things that happens with corporations is they begin to actually sell stock in their company. This means another way that we talk about this is you might hear the phrase going public. Stock means people are buying little pieces of your of your business. Then businesses can take all that money that they're getting and begin to expand. OK, and so this is what we call a corporation, corporate, these large corporations. OK, um, the other thing that we start in another way that we see corporations beginning and businesses getting bigger and bigger is through what we call merging of businesses. Businesses begin to merge, right? merge or join together. There's a couple of different ways that this happens, and this is still around today, um, and this is still happening today, and businesses join in order to be more powerful and more profitable, make more money, right? So the first one we see is what we call horizontal integration or a horizontal merger, and that's the picture that you have here. This is where you have one company that really controls the industry. So you would buy all the other companies that are selling the same thing or making the same products as you. OK, and so it's across the industry. It's horizontal. So here you see um, an oil refinery or an oil company is buying all the other oil businesses in the area. 
All right. So they're buying the same type of business. They're buying across the industry. They're buying the same types of businesses. So this is what we call horizontal integration. But another type of integration is what's called a vertical integration. Vertical is up and down, right? So horizontal, you buy all the businesses across the industry. So in the same business as you, vertical up and down is where you're controlling all parts of production. Okay, so you're buying all the businesses that have to do with making your product from the bottom to the top. All right, so here's a, an example of a meat packing industry, right? So they own the cattle, they own the slaughterhouse where those cattle are killed. They own the refrigerated trade cars, train cars that are then transporting that meat. They own the warehouses where the meat is being stored. They own the meat packing plant where that meat is then packaged in some way. They own the delivery wagons that then transport that meat. And then they own the actual stores where that meat is being sold. Okay, so you own all levels of production from the bottom to the top. That's vertical integration. So you're not buying all the other meat packing industries or you're not buying all the other stores that sell meat. That would be a cross. That would be horizontal integration or merger. But rather you're buying all the businesses that have to do with producing your product. So that's, again, from the bottom to the top, that's vertical integration. And we see a lot of this happening during the time period of industrialization here in the United States. And again, this really leads to the destruction of competition because they, if you own all factors of production, you can set your prices and therefore your goods are often cheaper. And so it destroys a lot of other businesses. Okay. Um, the other kind of impact of industrialization that we see is what we call the philosophy of the industrialist. Now, the industrialist is the, the owner. That's the best way to think about it. These big business owners, these industrialists, sometimes we call them things like titans of industry. They've built these huge businesses and they become incredibly wealthy. And their thought during this time is that big business was good business, right? If you can just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, that's the sign of you doing the right thing, that that's a good thing because you're getting more money. But one of the other side effects that we see of this is there was really no concern for the workers. And I talked about that a little bit um, last week. All right, so here's just some um, images. Most of the, all these are taken from a man named Jacob Rees. Um, he put together a um, book called How the Other Half Lives. And it was really looking at, so you have these industrialists who were kind of famous in their time. They're very well known even today. Names like Andrew Carnegie, maybe Ring a Bell. Um, and so lots of different people, Vanderbilt, were all industrialists during this time. But the workers had very, very, very different lives. And so you can see some images here of different homes that workers are living in, um, working conditions, lots of children working. Um, you can see down here just the city streets. You've got this dead horse in the street, um, just a lack of kind of concern or care for the living conditions of the workers and also the working conditions. And we talked about that a little bit last week when we talked about reasons why labor unions were formed. Um, but this was definitely one of the impacts of industrialization and what, um, with the industrialists, these really, really wealthy men who are making a lot of money with these big, big businesses. Um, this kind of I don't know, industrialization and this philosophy of the industrialist that big business was good business really ended up kind of le leading to a tension between democracy and capitalism. So capitalism is the economic system that we use here in the United States, this idea that um, you have private companies, right, that you can go out and you can start your own business as long as you're kind of following the laws of your state or your area. Um, and so that's capitalism. People have the opportunity to do that. You make your money, you keep your money besides paying taxes, right? You can do with it what you want. Democracy, on the other hand, right, is people participating, people having power in the government. We see that there's this tension that develops um, between these two kind of ideas, the, the political idea of a democracy and the economic system here in the United States, because democracy, the goal is based on equality, right? That everybody's voice is equal, but capitalism is really, really based on competition. Who's doing the best? Who has the biggest company? And so you don't see that equality play out in the economic system in any way. All right. True 
capitalism, as I mentioned, true kind of this economic system relies on what's called laissez-faire economics. Okay, laissez-faire means hands off or leave it be. Okay, leave it alone. It's a French term. All right. Um, and this really is talking about the government. The government should not be involved in business. The government should not be involved in the economic system. OK, however, what we see happen during this time period of industrialization was that the government actually acted in favor of the businesses. And they did this through things like land grants for the railroad companies. So railroad companies wanted to expand. The government was like, here you go. Here's some land. The farmers weren't given land. Right. Individual citizens weren't being granted land. And so we see this tension. This isn't laissez-faire. This isn't leave it alone. The government was very much helping the railroad companies get the land that they needed. And the owners of the railroad companies were incredibly wealthy. And part of that was because they didn't have to pay for the land for their railroads. All right. Another way that we see the government act in favor of big business was through keeping what we call tariffs high. You can see the word right here spelled for you, tariffs. Tariffs is like an import tax, okay? So a tariff means that anybody who makes something outside of the United States, they have to pay a tariff in order to sell it here in the US, right? So if I'm making something in the United States, I don't have to pay that tariff. So hopefully my good, my product will be cheaper than the good made outside of the United States. So if you keep tariffs high, this is protecting American made goods because hopefully it's keeping American made goods cheaper. The other way that the government acted in favor of big businesses, we saw this a little bit last week when we looked at um, the examples of the tension that existed between laborers, the workers, and the business owners. One of the things that the government ends up doing is actually outlawing labor unions. Um, they said that workers couldn't organize for better wages or better working conditions. And as we talked about last week, this really benefits the business owners because it's cheaper if there's no organized labor. They don't have to pay people as much and they don't have to worry about what their factory looks like. OK, and so we see even though they're supposed to be like in true capitalism, sh the government shouldn't be involved. We see the government being involved in supporting business, not supporting the workers, not supporting individual people. Um, some of the other impacts of industrialization during this time are some of the ideas that get spread. Um, one of those ideas is what we call social Darwinism. Hopefully you remember about Darwinism from learning from biology, right? This idea of survival of the fittest. Well, in the 1800s, in the 19th century, the 1800s, this idea gets placed on people, right? That those who are wealthy, those who are better, have a lot to offer everybody else. Those who are wealthy, those who are better, are superior, right? They're more advanced. And so social Darwinism is that also this, this idea of survival of the fittest, but within society. And this also then plays out to the idea that if the government should not actually help individual people, because if the government helps, then that is in fact ensuring survival of the unfit. OK, if, if the government is giving handouts to people or businesses, right, this also applies to businesses as well. Um, this political cartoon is from the Library of Congress and this idea, right, that the United States is teaching these poor people who don't know any better, these people from Puerto Rico and these people from Cuba and other countries. Right. Um, so, again, this idea that social Darwinism is that uh, survival of the fittest, that those who are wealthy are better they have they're clearly more advanced and we see this in imperialism across the country or sorry across the world throughout this um, century as well and then the other idea that kind of comes out of this time period is what we call the gospel of wealth this was really kind of started and propagated by andrew carnegie um, you may have heard of carnegie hall again a very very he's a very much an industrialist of his time andrew carnegie came up with the idea that the, the wealthy, right, actually have a duty or an obligation to help those who are less fortunate. Okay, and this contributes to social Darwinism, because then what if the wealthy are supposed to be taking care of the poor, and the wealthy are supposed to be taking care of those who are less fortunate, then the government doesn't have to be involved, right? Um, the gospel of wealth argues that the wealthy should in, get itself involved so the government doesn't. So you see um, the Carnegie Foundation starting things like libraries and schools and 
art, um, paying for theaters for people. And so really doing this, this word we call philanthropy. It's a super fancy word and I didn't put it on your slide here for you, but kind of doing good for the community and for those who are less fortunate. But that again, perpetuates this social Darwinism because if the wealthy are doing it, the government doesn't have the responsibility and doesn't need to do this, all right? Now, as you can imagine, as businesses are growing and people are kind of not seeing that the everyday people aren't seeing any benefits of this. Um, in fact, it's getting worse and worse for a lot of the workers. They're the people because of democracy and the power of the people, they began to put pressure on the government to regulate. So as the businesses grew, the pressure on the government to regulate these businesses also grew. Ultimately, what came out of this is what was called the Sherman Antitrust Act. This was passed in 1890. And the Sherman Antitrust Act prohibited businesses from combining or from merging if it would restrict trade, okay? So if there was some reason why two businesses merging together um, would, would be bad for the community, that it can't be allowed. However, while this law was passed, there was nobody to enforce it. There was no organization, there was no government entity that was there to actually enforce this law. And so it really ended up not doing anything. Not only that, but many government officials weren't really willing to enforce it, right? A lot of them had actually gotten campaign money from these businesses. So they're not gonna go against the businesses that paid for that to run their campaign, okay? They got the donations and they weren't willing to create legislation against the businesses or the limited the businesses. So even though we see in 1890, we see this law being passed, just kind of like we saw with the Civil Rights Act of 1864, right? 1964 changed things. 1864, a law was passed, but there was no teeth to it. There was nobody to actually enforce it. We see the same thing here. Um, there is a law. However, nothing actually changed. You can even see um, the bottom kind of corner of this political cartoon says it's an idle threat. There's really no power to the Sherman Antitrust Act. And we won't see any change really until later in the 19 kind of hundreds and into the 19 teens as a result of this. So this story of this impact of industrialization, this narrative really continues throughout the remainder of the 19th century or the 1800s and into the early 1900s. So here's our um, Works Cited page. Again, if you have any questions, as always, you can email me. Make sure you finish your structured notes. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.